with the first pitch. The voice of the Cardinals, Mike Shannon. Thank you, John Rooney. Mike Shannon is not only the voice of the Cardinals, he's the living embodiment of the franchise. (laughs) Shannon has just turned 80 years of age, and he's been a Cardinal in seven of his eight decades on earth. He's an icon here. I think he's probably the most recognized person in town. He's as much a Cardinal as the birds and the bat. We are underway. He wore one cap in the big leagues, but he's worn many hats in life. Multi-sport star. He could have done anything he wanted to do. World Series hero. He is just the biggest of his life right here. Survivor. Yeah, we had concerns. Bone vivant. I think he's saving all his sleep for the afterlife. <laughs> Restaurant tour. I enjoy that very much because uh, you get to meet people. And witness to history. You wouldn't believe it. He has celebrated and he has been celebrated. And tonight, we celebrate his seven decades of a cardinal life. We're rolling. Okay, uh, we got to start at the beginning here. The 80-year journey of Tom and Elizabeth Shannon's boy started here in 1939, only a handful of miles from the broadcast booth at Bush Stadium. Uh, Of course, in a criminal case, you always have to prove a criminal intent. Mike's dad was a policeman uh, who went on to law school and ultimately became the prosecutor for the city of St. Louis. And it was here in South City that Mike first got a ball in his hands and formed his early heroes. When did you start becoming a Cardinal fan? Well, when I was a kid, you know, I'd throw the ball, tennis ball up against the steps and pretend I was Harry Carey. <laughs> There's a drive, way back! It might be! It could be! It is! A home run! Were you broadcasting your... Sure, you know, here, you know, a diving play by Shannon and all that, you know. But it was, you know, for listening to Harry Carey that made you a fan and unusual. Musial was your hero? Oh, sure. Every, he was every kid's hero here in St. Louis. From his front yard, Mike took his young skills a mile away to Epiphany Grade School. There he met the first of his coaching mentors. We had a coach there, his name was Harry Bresnahan, and he was a bread truck driver, okay? He delivered bread. So he got up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning and he delivered all his bread and then, then, he, then he came and he dedicated his life to coaching. So it was great for us. The next stop on Mike's journey was three miles north to CBC's campus on Clayton Road. There he became a standout in three sports. In football, he led the cadets to an undefeated senior season and was named the Player of the Year. He was also named the Player of the Year in basketball. To date, no one has ever pulled off that double honor. He had one game in the state tournament where he shot 17 for 19 from the field. I was a driving center, (laughs) which they don't don't make those. They didn't make them then, they don't make them now. Because they were probably a little taller and slower and you just drove right by them or what? Yeah, I, I had a fake hook shot and drive. And then there was baseball. It was the sport he loved the most, and he did get offers to turn pro. But the bonus system in place at the time didn't make it a practical option. They had the $10,000 rule. If you got more than $10,000, you had to spend two years in the big leagues. And the only guy I know that was that good was uh, the Hall of Famer that played for the Detroit Tigers, played right field. Al Kaline. Al Kaline, that's correct. Nobody's seen more high school athletes over the last 40 years than you. Shannon was before your time, but where do you think he ranks in terms of St. Louis athletes? He's in the top five for sure. But he was, I'm told, a sensational athlete, that uh, he could have done anything he wanted to do. When you hear the stories about his throwing arm and what a good quarterback he was, and he was an accomplished basketball player, Uh, There was nothing he couldn't do. The sport he chose to pursue was football. 
and for that, he headed due west to Columbia in Old Mizzou. Recruited by brand new Tiger coach Frank Broyles, Shannon made quite an impression playing for the freshman team. Well, that was my game, really, football. Well, describe yourself as a quarterback. Well, I was a split T quarterback, you know, and the referees would come in and say, now listen, you got to be careful, don't blow the whistle too soon because uh, he, he's not really handing the ball off. I could fake pretty well. How big an impression did he make on Broyles and then on the man who came in a year later, Dan Devine? I first got to know about Mike Shannon when I used to have lunch a lot of times with Dan, Dan Devine. He thought he would have been a Heisman Trophy winner if he continued at Missouri. Regarded as an unbelievable athlete, right? Longtime broadcaster Jay Randolph recalls former Casty K general manager Bill Bolster bringing up that topic years later to both Shannon and to Broyles, who had gone on to a long career at Arkansas. At one point, uh, Bolster said to him, Shannon, how good a football player were you? And Mike looked at him and he said, Oh, I was as good as there was. I'd have won the Heisman Trophy. And Bolster got a big kick out of that. And for the next couple of years, he would use that often. Bill and I were playing golf at Augusta National Golf Club. And we went over for dinner and walked in and looked across the room. And Frank Broyles is sitting at a table over there. I said, let's go. Over. So we went over and said hello and everything. And Bolster says, Coach Broyles, I got to ask you. How good a football player was Mike Shannon? Broyles looked right and said, you know, if he'd have stayed at Missouri, he probably would have won the Heisman Trophy. In the meantime, Major League Baseball rescinded their bonus rule in 1958. Not long after that, Shannon found himself in the middle of a divine war. Mizzou coach Dan and new Cardinals GM Bing. The money was impossible to pass up. Shannon signed to play baseball for a bonus of $50,000. Ironically, he'll tell you that baseball was the hardest sport for him. And that's how he made a living. It was money. And he decided that baseball would be his future. Coming up. You were going to quit? That's correct. How Mike Shannon turned a corner in his baseball career and then found World Series glory in his hometown. And that big block letter, Shannon, home run, such and such, you know, so that was, it was a big thrill. I said, Mike, what went through your body when you saw that? He said, I just, I just got kind of chills. This is the Cardinals baseball network. McCarver let off with a double, Shannon up there now. You made quite the tour of America in your minor league career. Albany, Georgia, Jacksonville, Atlanta, Seattle, Portland, Tulsa. What was some of that like? <laughs> well, back then, you know, they had D ball, and then they had D, C, B, A, double A, and the triple A. And then we had three triple A ball clubs, so. Uh, you'd go to triple A, the big leagues, big leagues back to triple A, triple A back to the big leagues, so. You had to work your way up, it wasn't easy. Shannon first hit the big leagues in 1962. And in 1963, he saw a little more time on that veteran club including a memorable game when he filled in for the great Stan Musial. Stan's last time around, uh, everybody knew he was going to retire and it's going to be his last year, so they, they'd have a big day for him. And so Chicago was one of the last places we went into. And uh, so Stan went to the manager and he said, hey, I'm, I can't play today. And so he came to me and said, hey, Mike, you're going to play left field. So I go out and play left field and this guy's out in the bleachers. He said, hey, Shannon, he said, where's Musial? And he had his little 10-year-old kid with him, you know. I guess he said, I drove 750 miles to watch you play left field. <laughs> I really felt bad for him, you know, so. But after about three innings, I went in and out in the training room and usual signed the ball for me and I threw it up to him, so everything was good from then on. <laughs> in 1964, Shannon was at a crossroads. He had been sent back to AAA when he made a life decision. You set a deadline that if you didn't call up by a certain date, you were gonna quit? That's correct. Tell me about that. Well, I just set a date that if I didn't get recalled to the big league that I would quit. And uh, about a week before, they called me back up and history from there. <laughs> wow. History would be hard won that year. The underachieving Cardinals were in fifth place at the All-Star break when Mike was recalled. 
That was when tension between Johnny Keene and shortstop Dick Grote boiled over in front of an unsuspecting Shannon. Veteran outfielder Bob Skinner had the locker next to Mike. And there was a big meeting in New York. We were in New York, and uh, uh, Johnny Keene was the manager, and he's raising heck with this and that and so forth and so on. I'm sitting next to Skinner. He was 19, I was 18. I said, what's going on here? He said, quiet. <laughs> and that's what I was, quiet. Just as quietly, the Cardinals caught fire. Coupled with the epic collapse of the Phillies, the Cardinals crept into one of the most hotly contested pennant races ever. This is Harry Carey with Jerry Gross. On the final day of the regular season, any combination of three teams could have finished on top of the National League. There's a line drive to left field. It's going to drop in there for a base hit. Shannon singles to left, scoring McCarver. But it was the Cardinals who made it happen. A high pop ball. The Cardinals there. The Cardinals won the pennant. The Cardinals won the pennant. The Cardinals won the pennant. Everybody out. Everybody congratulate Game one of that World Series. Ready now, here's a pitch to Shannon. Swung on, deep into the left field. A home run off Whitey Ford is a local kid. My first crash, this ball is home run. A home run. That must have been the greatest throw of your life. Well, it was. Mike Shannon has just tied this ball game up with a tremendous home run off the scoreboard. And on the way home, I stopped and then bought a paper. That's when they had two papers and the Morning Globe had come out already and it had big block letters, Shannon, home run, such and such, you know. I said, Mike, what went through your body when you saw that? He said, I just, I just got kind of chills. Thinking about a newsboy holding up that newspaper and beating the mighty New York Yankees because young Mike Shannon hit a home run. That's pretty special. But he has hit the biggest of his life right here. That was, it was a big thrill. Pitch, the runner goes, the swing and the miss, the throw to second base will not be in time. The runner coming to the plate, the throw not in time. The double steal works. What I remember is that hitting the second baseman, Bobby Richardson, and the umpire saying, safe. Because I had made contact with him, you know. And so uh, that, that didn't register, but I stayed on the base, you know. He had to go like this to catch the ball, and so I hit him in the back. And uh, when I hit him, then the, the umpire said, safe. Now, these Cardinals are red hot right now. Gibson delivers. Swung on, popped up. Maxwell at second base. Calling for it. Makes the catch. The Cardinals win it. And this ballpark, complete bedlam. The Cardinals are the new world champions. Coming up. Off and it popped out the window when I looked in the rear view mirror and it boom, boom, four or five cars hit it. You Mike know. Shannon's lasting memory from his first championship season. And the letdown of the one that got away. Was that the most disappointing part of your career, you think? Yeah, I'm still mad about that. And uh, Wayne Wright's uh, delivery. Swinging a clunker to the third baseman. Edmund throws him out. And that's the second man down. And it brings the hero of the day was young Mike Shannon. As the 7-5 victory makes St. Louis the baseball champions of the world. There was just a bunch of overachievers on that team. They, they would have been successes no matter what field they went into. Okay, I ask this with a great deal of respect because I lose a lot of things. But you lost that World Series, that 64 World Series ring a couple of times. Aren't there some great stories here? Yeah, I was riding down uh, Interstate 70, and, uh, and it was after a game. And, uh, you know, during the summer, you sweat, and you swell up, your hands swell up. And so I was trying to get the ring off, and it popped out the window. And I looked in the rear view mirror, and then boom, boom, four or five cars hit it, you know. And I had to pull over, and it was, it was, uh, it was also drive time. So it, it was difficult getting out there and getting the ring. But it had a few scars. The high-flying Cardinals crashed in 1965. The defending champions finished seventh and cleaned house after the season. Meanwhile, Mike Shannon struggled as well with his average falling to 221. He learned the position of catcher and then filled in for four games because of injuries. He was an outfielder though, and a respected one. 
defensively in right field. He was really a great right fielder with an excellent arm. And everybody loved him because he was a team player. Both Shannon and the Cardinals showed improvement the next year. Mike put together a solid year at the plate with a career-best 16 homers. Included in that total was the last Cardinals homer hit at Old Sportsman's Park against Orlando Cepeda and the San Francisco Giants. Four days later, the team opened up spacious new Bush Memorial Stadium, and they had a new player joining them. We played the Giants the last game. We, then we went on the road. When we came back, uh, Cepeda was playing for us in the new ballpark because it wasn't ready yet. More about Cepeda's impact later, but Shannon tripled in the first run at the new park, and then the next day, he became the first Cardinal to homer there. It was later in the season, after a monster blast at Wrigley Field, that Mike earned a new nickname, Shannon the Cannon. 1966 also found him considering a return to football. The expansion Atlanta Falcons remembered Mike Shannon, the college quarterback. One of the coaches had, had tried to recruit me in college, and, uh, and they were staying at the same hotel, and it was, in, it was their spring training, you know. And uh, so I just happened to run into him, and so we started talking, and he said, we ever think about playing football again? And I said, yeah, I would if they got enough money. And so he got back to me later, but then I started to play every day, and, so things, things changed in that interim. Little did he know at the time how much change there was to come. I thought they owed me the courtesy of at least letting me retire if I wished to retire. And... Instead, the Yankees traded Roger Maris to the Cardinals. Again. Then in the fourth inning, it happens. Five Maris years removed from setting the all-time home run record, Maris was now battling injuries. But he was a two-time MVP. Putting him in right field meant Mike Shannon would be on the move. Destination, third base. Isn't it true that you actually picked up ground balls at Forest Park to That's get ready? Correct, Tell yeah. me about that. Well, uh, one of our coaches was Joe Schultz, and it was during the wintertime, and they were trying to make a decision on, on trading uh, their, their third baseman for Roger Maris. And uh, so they took me over to the park to hit ground balls. And so was, yeah, they thought if I, could, I could play third. Mike just knocked him down and p picked it up with that arm gun him out. Part of his evolution as an infielder was learning how to position himself. He went to ace pitcher Bob Gibson for advice. I asked him one day, I said, where do you want me to play? He said, I don't give a damn where you play unless there's a man on first and less than two outs. He said, then be ready. And man, I'm going to tell you, bomb, bomb. He'd take a right-handed bat and he'd just turn the ball over a little bit and they'd hit a one hopper to third, double play. <laughs> Mike moving to third, uh, even though he was the, the, the best uh, third baseman in the history of the game, he wasn't Kenny Boyer, but he was good enough You'd knock it down and throw you out. The move also would be key to making bigger money. Shannon was still relying on an off-season job to help pay the bills, like working in sporting goods at Famous Bar, for instance. There was a lady in there that was the manager, okay, and so I got, I got the cheese, which was left over, you know. So here didn't come this guy with bib overhauls and everything. She said, hey, kid, you take him. We had a... We had a shotgun that was on sale, uh, an Italian shotgun, and he was a farmer, and he came in to buy. That shotgun cost like $500. I got the commission because she said, you take him, kid. You know, he came in there with his overalls and everything. She said, he ain't going to buy anything. So I got that sale. The 1967 Cardinals defied the experts who picked them to finish in the middle of the National League pack. Led by Cepeda, they became known as Albertos, the man nicknamed Cha-Cha would go on to win the league MVP award. Lou Brock ignited the batting order, and Maris solidified it. You and Maris became best friends, right? Correct, yeah. What was he like in uh, your he, friendship? I'll tell you what, he, for two years he played here, and I never saw him make one mental mistake. You know, he made an error here and there, but he never made one mental. He didn't throw the wrong base or anything like that. And run the bases, he was the best I've ever seen. The Cardinals became the best in 1967, even after losing the great Gibson for two months with a broken leg. Shannon comes up. Fastball is hit in the air to left center field and deep. She's off the wall. Here comes Maris, and the Cardinals win it. The new third baseman finished second on the team in RBIs as the Cardinals won the pennant by ten and a half games. 
Shannon cuts viciously at Bell's first pitch. And there it goes. He hung it. It was up and in, and uh, I didn't hit it on the good part of the bat, and uh, it just got down the line. Uh, I was pretty sure it was going to be a home run, uh, uh, but of course you can't tell. In the World Series, they faced the Boston Red Sox, trying to complete the impossible dream season. Instead, a now healthy Gibson made that task an impossibility. And Scott strikes out. The Cardinals win. It is one of the most iconic Cardinal photos. The October 1968 Sports Illustrated cover shot. It was taken in 60... 67. The magazine tabbed them as the highest paid team in baseball history, and they played like a dynasty in the making. In the year of the pitcher, the Cardinals easily rolled to another pennant. The first game of the 1968 World Series. Here's a 3 2 pitch. Strike three. You got to watch Gibson's 17 strikeout game one. Just describe that dominance. Strike three, they won't get to in this inning. Well, all I did was catch the ball from McCarver and throw it around the infield. He had 17 strikeouts, so it was kind of an easy day for me. Strike three. Two and two pitch coming up to Mike Shannon. There's a base hit to left field. The Cardinals appeared ready to take apart the Detroit Tigers. But a funny thing happened on the way to that dynasty. And there it goes the other way. They got him picked off. Barry almost thought he misjudged it over his head. Two runs are going to score. They never got them. <laughs> Was that the most disappointing part of your career, you think? Yeah, I'm still mad about that. Really? Yeah. That's a long drive. It wasn't long after the team was dismantled. How do you remember that? Well, uh, it wasn't easy because, you know, that was still a really good team, and uh, they gave up on it too early in my estimation. Coming up, Mike Shannon comes to another crossroads. Would Mike Shannon's life had been in jeopardy? Anyone who has this disease, their life is in jeopardy. And safe or out would be the least of his concerns. Uh, it's going to be in our ballpark uh, next year, most likely, and uh, in the future, it's going to be in just about all the ballparks. So it's going to become a matter of uh, getting accustomed to it and uh, uh, learning how to play it. And it's as simple as that because you're going to play on it. One and two to Mike Shannon, strong right hand hitting third baseman. Mike Shannon saw the inevitability of the AstroTurf as he looked into the future in 1969. The reality at the end of that season was that Shannon had slumped at the plate, the team around him fell into fourth place in the new National League Eastern Division, and team fixtures were being traded away. Mike himself was the subject of trade rumors, but he couldn't have possibly seen what else was coming in the spring of 1970. Take me through when you found out about the kidney disease. Well, it was just a routine uh, exam in spring training. The disease is called glomerulonephritis. Dr. Stan London was the Cardinals team physician for 30 years and first noticed the irregularity. It's a condition where if it continues, the kidney function deteriorates. And the kidney is a remarkable uh, organ. It keeps a hold of the things that he wants the body to keep and gets rid of the things that the body doesn't need and needs to get rid of. When the function goes down the drain, then just the opposite happens. And if that progresses, it goes on to kidney failure. Well, I might be down, but I'm not out. Uh, this is uh, something that's come along. It's a problem, and uh, I'll have to face it. Shannon was immediately shut down from physical activity and shipped to St. Louis for treatment with a kidney specialist. They take the test and uh... Uh, they have to wait to see how the medication uh, works, and uh, they can't really definitely give me a time. But he was taking cortisone, <clears throat> massive, massive doses of cortisone. Uh, he was taking doses that the steroid area baseball players wouldn't have dreamed of. But I know that he was, he's not supposed to be here because they gave him, what, six months to live. Was he ever close to death? It, uh, during the days 
when uh, Mike had gained probably 60 pounds as a result of his illness and as a result of the medication that he was taking. Um, we were still waiting for that kidney to turn around and that wasn't happening right away at that time. Yeah, we had concerns. Eventually, the medication did its work. Enough so, by mid-May, he was able to rejoin the Cardinals. However, three months later, he was shut down again. I tried to come back, but, you know, I put on 20 pounds because of the medicine I was taking. I would taken steroids and it just didn't work. It wasn't me I was worried about. I was married and had five children. And I was worried about that more than anything. And that must have also been difficult because here your whole life is about sports, being the best athlete around and not being able to play it at the time. Well, the other thing concerned me more than uh, that. When we come back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mike Shannon, Act Two how he found longevity in a brand new direction. Jack Buck said, would you believe Mike and I have been broadcasting for 25 years? And Jack Buck said, boy, it seems longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed playing. And, uh, I, I enjoyed the psychological part of the game more than the physical part of it. What do you mean? Well. For instance, I might go over to the pitcher in the seventh inning and say, hey, if you get this guy out, we'll win the game. And he'd look at me like, what are you talking about? But I knew if we got him out, we wouldn't have to face Mays in the ninth inning with the man on in a close game. So that's the part that I enjoy. A wild and woolly ball game. And man, have we had some interesting developments today. Bing Devine, who was a general manager, I, he wanted me to manage the, the baseball team. He'd offer me... Uh, the triple a job managing and then he offered me a coaching job in the big leagues and i just couldn't do that at the time because it, was, it just took too much time you know and i'd what i had put my wife through is when i was sick and she had to take care of the kids and all that and take care of me but um, then he came to me a couple months later and he said hey that some people have asked me to feel you out about the broadcasting situation i said yeah i could kind of make my own schedule there and i went from there Lou, this gives us a great opportunity to talk a little bit about stealing. I know that's not a thing you talk about around the house very often. In the spring of 1972, the new Cardinals broadcaster took his first steps with mixed results, both on KSD TV and also with Jack Buck on KMOX Radio. Thank you, Mike. All right, Lou Brock, stealing bases, and we hope it's informed you in some way. Thank you. The story goes that it was one of Mike's first games and Jack wanted to get the names of the umpire. And he said, hey, Mike, can you go down and get the umpires? And according to Jack, Mike brought two guys in a headlock, brought, brought two, got two umpires up with, in a headlock and asked them, well, what do you want me to do with the other two? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was very rough, no question about that. And uh, at the same time, he was Mike. He did it his way. And it was his way, and he learned. And here to make a special presentation to the home run king is Stan the Man Musial. <laughs> How did that Jack help in the early? Just by sitting next to him, that's all, paying attention. Just watching. That's correct. A 2-2 two -two pitch. Breaking ball. Hit off the pitcher. To the third baseman. No play. Base hit. Three thousand. They took a gamble by putting him on the air, frankly, but as the years went by, it got better and better. This evening, it is Nolan Ryan for Houston. Kurt Kepchire going for the Cardinals. I think it's fitting that the Cardinals should face a very good pitcher like Nolan Ryan here tonight, Jay, because they're one game under the 500 mark. And you've got to get the 500 if you're going to do anything in this world of baseball. So they went here tonight and tomorrow. They'll have a great trip coming back into St. Louis, a game over 500. Is it a source of pride that you won an Emmy in 1985, looking at how hard you worked to become a broadcaster, and you're given an Emmy? Well... That, you, and you got to give Jay Randolph some of that credit, too, because I was his partner, all right? I have a chance to break records. That gives me motivation each and every day. Every day, that's the name of the game, Jay. He keeps doing it. Jay? All right, thank you very much, Mike. You know, everybody mentions Jack Buck because of the radio, but 
Let me tell you something. Jay Randolph is one of the great broadcasters of all time, no matter what it was. There were like certain things you wanted to do during the course of a day, and sleep could not get in the way. What did you want to do? <laughs> is that the question? Yes. That you're rolling. <clears throat> <laughs> there were uh, legendary after games, maybe have a pop and then get up real early to play golf. I think he's saving all his sleep for the afterlife. <laughs> now, he doesn't go as hard as he used to. Uh, we'd play golf in the morning, and then we'd go to the racetrack in the afternoon, and then the ballpark at night, and then we'd have a, you know, a, a toddy or two. <laughs> that was the routine, and then we'd start it all over again. But if it was baseball in New York, it was up at six in the morning and go to Wingfoot. Hop back in his car, drive to Belmont Park, have lunch in the director's room and watch the races in the afternoon, and then back into the car and over to Shea Stadium, do the game, then back into the car downtown to a restaurant they'd keep open for Mike, and uh, on and on. <laughs> One of the hometown broadcasters would come into the booth, and I swear it happened multiple times. He'd look into the booth, see me, and he goes, Where's the world's strongest man? Stan Musial used to catch just a, a little nap, sometimes uh, a few minutes maybe in the corner of the dugout before a game starts or whatever, and uh, whenever he happened to shut his eyes, well, Mike picked up on that, and it seemed to work really well for him. You know, he, he finds a way to get a nap in during the day, and that's something he taught me early in the business. He said, hey, you know, you might want to make sure you get at least a 20, 40 minute nap in during the day. If you can do that, you can go all night. And, and he's been right. I played golf with him. A seven foot putt was a gimme. Uh, he was never in the ditch. He was never out of bounds. Uh, if you lost his ball in the weeds, he always ended up 100 yards in front of Red Shandies who hit the goddamn ball further than all of us. Jack Buck, Red Shandies, and I. Uh, a foursome that was uh, very interesting. We'd rotate partners, we'd throw the balls up, we'd argue a lot. Uh, Buck would always say, watch, watch Shannon, I know he's cheating, and <laughs> things like that. I remember on the 25th anniversary when Jack Buck said, would you believe Mike and I have been broadcasting on KMOX radio, a Cardinal broadcast for 25 years? And Jack Buck says, Boy, it seems longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> we had so much great fun, and we had so many wonderful friends that uh, we had built up over the years. He enjoys people, enjoys life, and, and that, uh, I think, is uh, the best trademark you can uh, say of anybody. We're at Mike Shannon's place. You know, with this kind of memorabilia, and with Mike's name, you really don't have to have great food to get people in here. But they do. Let's snap on this right here. This is the one with the no onion. How much do you enjoy being Mike Shannon in the restaurant tour? Because you've been one for how many years? A long time 30 years. now. And uh, I enjoy that very much because you get to meet people. And you get to meet them on their time rather than your time, you know. So uh, that's all. That's very enjoyable. Yeah, sure, you know exactly what he, when he changed and you adapted every time you went up there. I'll tell you a funny story. Shannon's enjoyment of people extends to the long-running show that began at his restaurant's downtown location. Live at Shannon's, I contend, is the best radio we've ever had in St. Louis, where you go one-on-one -on -one with some of the greats of all time in a really relaxed setting. Man, we've had, we've had some unbelievable guests on there. I mean, we've had... Uh, actors, actresses, uh, uh, politicians, uh, baseball greats. I mean, it was, it, it got to where... But you got them to talk. Yeah, but, you know, it's just it's relaxing, okay, you know, uh, because it was a relaxing situation, you know, it was at the restaurant and it wasn't like an interview, and, and I mean, uh, I can remember <laughs> I, I interviewed uh, uh, the great rock and roller that, that died about in St. Charles not too long ago. Oh, Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, and he said, you know, I've never been interviewed for an hour. <laughs> I said, well, we got another hour to go, Chuck, so hang in there, buddy. <laughs> when we return... Hit him right on the thigh. Mike Shannon is now the longest tenured broadcaster in Cardinals history. 
second. And he's had some moments. He is safe! There it is! Take a ride on that knockdown pitch, big boy! We'll relive the best of the best and find out the secret of his popularity. That hurts. <laughs> McGee gets a hit here. He'll tear the place down. Bringing the ground ball up the middle. The shortstop can't get it. Here comes Ozzy. Here comes the throw. They may get him. Save! Save! Ozzy scores! Great moments behind the mic. Let me just say a couple and you just give me a quick thought, all right? Mm -hmm. um, McGuire's number 62. Cracks of wines and fires. Big Mac. Swing! And a shot into the corner. It might make it. At the end of that half inning, after everybody went crazy, Jack and Mike were standing there, and Jack turned to Mike and said, Mike, I'm glad you got to call it. And Jack had a tear running down his face. And there was a handshake and a little bit of a, of a man hug, you know. Uh, I thought that was really kind of neat. I thought that was really kind of neat. It was kind of emotional, to tell you the truth. A new home run champion, Mark McGuire. Way to go, Matt. Well, I remember his 70th morning, 62. He's set, and the first one to a Big Mac. Swing, and it's get up, baby, get up, get up, get up. Home run, he's done it again. The last weekend of the season, he had 65 home runs. He hit five home runs in the last three games. And the 70th home run they hit, there was a line drive in the left field corner, and that's where that get up, baby, get up came, because, you know, I mean, it was, it was a line shot, and it went right into the, it was about that high over the wall. 70 home runs. Take a ride on that for history. How, how can you end a season better than Big Mac has just done? Unbelievable. Calling the final out of a World Series. They came from nowhere to astound the baseball world. What a season. Oh, that's great. But I think, I think even better than that is calling a no-hitter. And I got to call the forces no-hitter. He's set into the windup. Here's the 1-1. One -one. Swinging a ground ball. The third baseman over field has it. The throw. Forces hits the no-hitter. It's the first time in the history of Cardinal baseball that a pitcher has two no-hitters. And listen to this crowd. The pitch. Swing and hello, 4th of July. Take a ride on that knockdown pitch, big boy. Terry Wood knocked him down, and now Albert looks at him as he goes around first. He gives him a glare. Say, take a little whiff of that, big boy. And now, Kerry Wood takes a look at Albert as he touches them all. Mike's, Mike's a piece of work. Um, what do you say, big boy, you know, and stuff like that? You know, he uses the expression, hey, big boy, a lot. That he called President Bush big boy when President Bush came to throw out the first pitch. They brought him in the broadcast booth, and I'm told Mike said, hey, big boy, welcome. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it would not surprise me. We're out on the tarmac waiting for the, the team buses. And Mike says, because both my wife and his wife were meeting us at, at LAX. Come with me, big boy. And we're on the tarmac at LAX. Comes over, he flags down one of the cart guys, just, you know, pulling luggage and they flags him down, says, hey, we got to go over there. We jump on the, uh, the, the luggage guy's cart. He takes us to a hidden door. We go up steps and we open a door. Literally was a hidden door in the terminal and we're in the middle of the terminal. You know, no, no security, no people. He goes, I'll take care of you, big boy. <laughs> Give it to him, big boy. Give it to him. How about Pools' is Homer off Lidge, 2005? Yeah, that was good. Swing and a long one. There it is, baby. The Cardinals take the lead as Albert Pujols comes through in the pit. And the Redbirds lead this baby 5-4. to four. You know, he's one of the five greatest players ever. 
When you put his stats up against the rest of them. You know. Listen to these fans. Listen to them. Man, oh man, this might be it. Wayne. We talked about turning points. We look at that double play the other night. Now you can look at these back to back and listen to these fans. Just listen. There's only two guys that have ever done what he's done, and that's him, himself, Pujols, and Willie Mays. You know, 600 home runs plus and 3,000 plus hits. Here's a pop-up foul, first base side. And it's going to go uh, over the tarp, and a phenomenal play by the first baseman, Cooper. Wow. I think he's one of the most observant people I've ever seen. Uh, He'll even tell you who comes out for the national anthem and who doesn't. Uh, he pays attention to the smallest detail about the game. And he'll make a comment about it. And three innings later, boom, there it is. And he, he's a very observant person, uh, especially when it comes to the game. There's very few things that slip by. Uh, he's going to feel that one, Mike. Yeah, for sure, but it's an out. Big, big crowd, uh, 44,000 plus here again tonight. I called a home run for Albert Pujols. Uh, it was a grand slam. And when it was all said and done, uh, the, I think the runners were moving on the play. Is what made it unique. And Pujols hit one a mile. And he said, that was a pretty good call on that, but were you ready for the triple play? <laughs> Something to think about. If that's a line drive to third, that's a triple play, you know, innings over. These are all the siblings, sisters, brother, brother-in-law. Buddy, take the picture. Mike Shannon turned 80 last week. Friends and family gathered at his restaurant to pay tribute to the man and his life. If this past hour and the testimony of Mike's close friends are any indicator, his has been a life well lived. The Cardinals Hall of Fame. He's an icon here. He's as much a cardinal as the birds in the back. Being a charter member of Cardinal Hall of Fame, is that your greatest honor to date? Well, no, I think my greatest honor is just walking in the broadcast booth every day. That's tremendous. He never tried to be that polished. He tried to be himself. And I think he's polished that act very well. It's almost like he's sitting on, in your living room. Jim Jackson's here. You know what that means. The lottery is still available. He'll look at Jim Jackson and realize Jim Jackson didn't win the lottery. Or he'll talk about Fast Eddie or other people that he knows that has nothing to do with the game. He, he's in a lot of different places, but he's holding a conversation. And oh, by the way, there happens to be a baseball game going on. I don't think he could go a lot of places and broadcast, but he's the perfect guy for St. Louis. Why do you think you've become so popular with fans? Because I was just myself and I never tried to be anyone else. And I had some great partners too, you know. He's one in a million. I mean, you, you can't compare him to anybody. Think about that. Who would you compare him to? And with the bases loaded, the uh, curveballs, a swing and a miss. He struck him out, inning over. Here's the look and the pitch to Shannon. Lined in the right field along the line. It's going to be fair ball down in the corner. Here's McCarver at third, headed for home. And the throw to the plate, he scores. I should apologize to him. <laughs>